This week, on the record, a massive case at the Supreme Court, Missouri versus Biden. Can social media platforms censor or stifle your speech? Can the government ask them to? Why three conservative justices on the Supreme Court seem unconvinced the government crossed the line. Senator Eric Schmidt filed that lawsuit as Missouri's attorney general. He's on the record as we dig into a case with major implications for free speech in the digital age. It's all coming up right now. Welcome to The Record, I'm Mark Maxwell. The First Amendment is core to the American experience. It's first for a reason. Free speech empowers political debate and prohibits a national religion. It also protects religious practice, open expression, academic curiosity, and especially criticism of the government. It fuels the free press and even enables shows like this. So when the Supreme Court heard arguments about a case that Missouri's former Attorney General and current U.S. Senator called the most important free speech case in our lifetime, perhaps in American history, you can bet we took notice. What exactly are we allowed to say? Where can we publish it? How many people should be allowed to read or hear what we have to say? Often, questions about the limits of the First Amendment are brushed aside by some professor who might say, oh, well, you can't shout fire in a crowded theater. But what if there actually is a fire? Or what if there's something just as deadly but even more invisible to the naked eye? This court case, now known as Murphy v. Missouri, stems from the peak of the pandemic. Its precedent could have far-reaching implications for decades to come. Former Missouri Attorney General Eric Schmidt filed the case, Missouri v. Biden, alleging the federal government had violated the First Amendment rights of American citizens when it coordinated with social media companies to limit the spread of what they called vaccine hesitancy. At the Supreme Court Monday, justices poked holes in those oral arguments and found faults and misleading claims, sometimes omitted key facts in the written briefs. So the lawyer representing the case that Eric Schmidt first brought tried to clarify. This is the example he raised from the record. He said it would show the greatest injury from the government's action to a private citizen via that third party of Facebook in this case. On May 1st, 2021, a Facebook executive emails the White House. I wanted to send you a quick note on three pieces of vaccine content that were seen by a high number of people before we, Facebook, demoted them. Although they don't violate our community standards, we should have demoted them before they went viral. More than half a million Americans had already died from COVID-19. That's according to data compiled by Johns Hopkins. And the vaccine was just becoming readily available to people under 65. It was still very new and the public was eagerly awaiting reliable information about its effectiveness and safety. One portion of that email from Facebook to the White House was titled, Do Not Distribute or Amplify Vaccine Hesitancy, and Facebook Should End Group Recommendations for Groups with a History of COVID-19 or Vaccine Misinformation. It points to research that suggested, don't amplify vaccine hesitancy content. In other words, Facebook wanted the White House to know they were taking down stop signs that might have otherwise discouraged people from getting a life-saving vaccine. I'm going to stop here and ask you to remember something. Did you ever see any information that might have raised questions for you about whether the vaccine was safe or effective? In other words, did it work, the alleged censorship, or were you still able to find mountains of arguments, news stories, social media posts, videos, and other digital forms of expression urging you not to get vaccinated? In that email chain to the Facebook official told the White House, quote, we are working to improve automatic detection for events hosting anti-vaccine and COVID content. Those events might have happened in real life or perhaps in virtual spaces. Another section appeared to single out specific user accounts, though. It was labeled 12 accounts that are responsible for 73% of vaccine misinformation. That part appears to be the part the Missouri and Louisiana state lawyers felt the government may have crossed a line when 12 individuals in particular were identified for suppression. But in that email that they provided as evidence, it was Facebook who identified them. The Facebook official said, quote, our dedicated vaccine discouraging entity policy is designed to remove groups and pages that are dedicated to sharing vaccine discouraging content. Okay, why this long preamble? Because however the Supreme Court ultimately rules in this case, the future of the First Amendment itself is at stake. And this is the prime example, Exhibit 1A, that the lawyers provided to prove the government was systematically violating free speech by coercing Facebook to remove or stifle the spread of uh, that content. That brings us to the first part of our interview with the man who brought the lawsuit against the government, U.S. Senator and the former Attorney General of Missouri, Eric Schmidt, is now on the record. 
Senator, I admit this is not usually my style, but I'd like to start by thanking you for something you said in a Twitter spaces, uh, spaces conversation Wednesday night. You said, quote, the First Amendment is the beating heart of our Constitution. As someone whose profession relies on its protection, I couldn't agree more. Yep. I think that the ability for people to express themselves is a fundamental uh, fundamental right, and it's it's uniquely American in many ways, Mark, and I think that's why it's so important to, to protect it, even if I disagree with it. I think the real test here is, are you willing to defend somebody's point of view, even if you vehemently oppose it? And I think that's really important for a bunch of reasons. It's also a bit of a pressure release valve when times can get really tense and difficult uh, for people to air out, um, you know, their, their frustrations and, and their points of view. It's been something that I've um, focused on in my in my maiden speech on the Senate floor is certainly, you know, front and center in Missouri versus Biden. I'm going to continue to work on that. This case is so interesting because it doesn't just include that relationship between uh, government and citizen or government and a private company or platform, but between all three of these different parties. So I wonder if we can try to talk about this in ways that are perhaps more conversational than some of that dry legal debate sure. in the Supreme Court. For example, You've probably heard of, of the contours of this debate, sometimes defined as the freedom of speech and the uh, freedom of reach. Let me ask you this. Does the First Amendment entitle me to publish something on your website? Schmidt for like the, the government website? I'm, I'm not, I guess I don't understand. Any website at all, any website that you own privately, publicly, does the First Amendment entitle me to publish something on it. You have a point of view if it's, an, if it's an, sort of an open platform. I, I don't know like the structure or what you're talking about about how a website would be designed where you would be able to post on it. Uh, I would certainly defend your right to have a point of view in, it, in a sort of an open town square, a virtual town square. Let me ask the question a, a different way. Would the First Amendment require you to circulate my writings far and wide? Uh, no. You don't deny that these private companies that are supposed to, their, their websites, they have an inherent self-interest and a right to control or even censor content that they circulate. Yeah, look, these are private companies and they can have terms of service and they can have terms of conditions. There's no question about that. The, the uniqueness of big tech and social media platforms though, Mark, is that they're given special protections under Section 230. They can't be sued. So they're not treated like KSDK or the New York Times or the Post-Dispatch as publishers making editorial decisions. And so in 1996, it was determined like these are going to be open platforms. People can have their point of view. And therefore, we're not going to hold you responsible for the views that are on that open platform. The problem, though, is once they go into the world of editorializing, right, or making sort of viewpoint decisions, it's my view if they get into the censorship business, they can do that, but they should lose their Section 230 protections, right? So if you're dealing with the question of the private entity, uh, that's the state of play. What this case deals with, though, of course, is the federal government coercing these social media companies to be an extension of the government. And they don't get to do, you don't do, the First Amendment doesn't allow them to do an end run around the Constitution through private actors. You've actually got a bill that would let people sue these big tech platforms, maybe strip them of that 230 legal protection. It's interesting, the justices in their arguments said maybe a person in government floating that idea of yours, stripping those 230 protections, might be a government actor threatening them or coercing them. I, I guess that's just an aside here. You said something else, though, on your Twitter Spaces conversation. You said that government told social media, you'd better do this, you'd better take this down or else. Now, there's a lot of pages here. Maybe I just missed it. Where was the or else? Well, I'm not, did you read the 20,000 pages submitted for the record? I, I actually scanned a lot of them searching for keywords, trying to find that evidence. I guess I wouldn't expect you to, but, but there are a few things at play here, Mark. Sort of this is a Biden administration that stood at the podium saying we are flagging and we want them to take this stuff down. Joe Biden himself was saying that Facebook was killing people. You had the Surgeon General uh, texting directly with a high ranking Facebook official saying take it down. They said they took it down. Actually, later on, that official said that we only did that because the government was compelling us to do it. You had special censorship portals. You had weekly censorship meetings. You had FBI officials pre-bunking stories. And there's also a standard of, you know, significant encouragement um, that could also be a standard that the court, you know, decides this case on. Regardless of your political views here, the idea that the federal government would be that involved in censoring Americans, in quelling dissent, in telling people you can't say that, that's a very un-American concept. And again, as I've said, they don't get to outsource that kind of outright censorship to these biggest companies in the history of the world. And to be clear, I think the public does have a definite right to know all of these things were happening. And, and really, a lot of this came to light because of the lawsuit you filed. So I have to give credit there. But uh, you were the one that said 
the government uh, said do this or else. And I still haven't heard you say where exactly that or else came in. Let me ask you about this, though. You said, quote, even the threat of investigations is what really crosses the line here. I'm quoting you again from your conversation on Twitter. Was that threat explicit or implied? The way Justice Barrett asked that question is just because someone in the government asks a question, does it carry that implied threat because of where they work in the government? It can. It can depend. I mean, this is, again, this is an executive branch of administration that has not shied away of going after political opponents opening investigations. I mean, Elon Musk, all of his companies now suddenly are under a federal investigation, SEC investigation. Political opponents are being threatened to be thrown in jail for the rest of their lives. Catholics were threatened uh, by the FBI. So I think this administration has shown a willingness to go cross that line uh, for sort of political purposes. I also think they were very explicit about going after Section 230 protections unless they censored more. So it's one thing to say, look, if you're going to kind of not be a, a platform and be a publisher, you probably shouldn't have those protections. But if the threat is, if you don't censor the way we want you to censor, we're going to take away your Section 230 protections. That's pretty explicit. I'm very confident that the record's been established. And again, this is, you have to remember when this case was filed, this was around the time where the government said they wanted to create a disinformation governance board. I mean, a ministry of truth in the United States of America and under the guise of, and took of challenging and taking down disinformation and misinformation. I mean, this is Orwellian stuff, Mark. And I just, I guess I'm, I'm old enough to remember, I think this should be a unifying thing, honestly. I don't view this in a partisan lens. I'm old enough to remember when liberals supported the First Amendment and free speech. And so to me, this is something to say, the government doesn't get to be the arbiter of the truth. That is inherent. As individuals, we get to seek that out and make our own decisions. And so the government, you know, they can, Jen Psaki or whoever can stand at that podium and say, this is what we believe to be true. But you don't then get to work the back channels affecting algorithms, terms of service, censorship portals to take down speech um, as the government or certainly, again, uh, working with social media companies to do that. More of our conversation with Senator Schmidt right after this. Welcome back to our extended conversation with Senator Eric Schmidt. He sued President Biden's administration for violating the First Amendment when White House aides spoke with social media platforms about content discouraging vaccines during the peak of the pandemic. Here's a portion of that oral argument at the Supreme Court Monday. Can the government call the platforms and say, this information that you are putting up on your platform is creating a serious public health emergency. We are encouraging you to take it down. I, I was with you right until that last comment, Your Honor. I think they absolutely can call and say, this is a problem, it's going rampant on your platforms. But the moment that the government tries to use its ability um, as the government and its stature as the government to pressure them to take it down, that is when you're interfering with third party speech rights. Well, and even remember if the you... third. Go ahead, finish your. Your Honor, I was just going to say, even remember that the third party here is completely absent from the conversation. The third party whose speech is being targeted and ultimately censored is absent from this discussion. I'm glad this information came to light, that it was happening secretly, I think, just adds to the complexity of the issue. You've said, though, that actions to silent dissent could have the effect of enabling tyrants or dictators. Those were your words. Was it a threat or was it a First Amendment violation when Donald Trump said the government should investigate NBC News for what he called, quote, country-threatening treason. I don't even know what you're talking about, Mark. I, I have no idea. I'm not familiar with the quote. Clearly, there can be banter uh, between political figures and the news media. But again, I think one of the distinctions that needs to be made in this case was this is not your typical interaction between a sort of a, the government and a publisher. This is a third party intermediary of speech, right? So in many ways, individuals would never even know if their thoughts or their, their points of view, average ordinary Americans were being throttled or suppressed because of changes to the terms of service or through algorithmic changes. And so again, this was a, not just a one-off from one government official saying something. This was a Leviathan of government agencies and officials in a coordinated way, taking down speech for what was a disapproved narrative by the government. And so a very different example than the one that you gave. You know that, that this isn't a one-off example either. We've got several other examples, but just gotta ask one last question for you, Senator, because I know we're running low on time. The case here revolves around an interesting question. Can people who work in government 
are they entitled to free speech? People like teachers or school administrators or people outside of government, maybe like boardroom executives. I ask you that specifically because you, Senator, from your high perch in a government position, said this, quote, woke activism has no bearing on the fiduciary duties of a company and has no place in the corporate boardroom. You pledged to, quote, root out woke investing and shield Americans' hard-earned dollars from hyperpartisan investment practices. Haven't you crossed a line in threatening to limit the expression of someone else's values? You're so hostile um, to these First Amendment arguments as a liberal yourself and a member of the media. It is surprising that we've sort of crossed a Rubicon. But to answer your question directly, these companies have a fiduciary duty to the senior citizens that they represent, to the people that have made investments, to go out and get a return, not to make woke decisions. And so by law, they're supposed to go do that. So again, uh, the example just doesn't hit the mark. I know you're trying to find something that I've said that was the same thing. I am actually open to and supporting people having widely divergent views, including the ones that I don't agree with. But when the government then, you know, when you've got sort of people that are violating the law to, to you know, have a woke, uh, you know, checklist they can sign off to make somebody happy and they're threatening people's retirement savings or their pensions, I'm going to stick up for those people because it's in violation of the law. Of course, there was no hostility there. I just wanted to see if you'd hold yourself or Donald Trump to the same standard you hold Joe Biden. But we're out of time. Republican Congressman Mike Bost won his primary race. The concession speech from his opponent, next. Incumbent Mike Boss defeated GOP challenger Darren Bailey last week. And most concession speeches after an election include words of congratulations or an olive branch, a pledge to unite behind the victor. Not Tuesday night, not from Darren Bailey. In a rather unusual move, instead he condemned what he saw as apathy from perhaps his most loyal block of supporters. Congressman Mike Boss is breathing a sigh of relief. Primaries are tough, and I'm really glad this one is over. Before jetting off back to Capitol Hill Wednesday morning, Boss thanked his supporters Tuesday night for helping him beat back a primary challenge from farmer Darren Bailey. His name recognition was, was strong. I don't know that his message was strong. In a concession speech from his private Christian school, we truly believe this is our mission field. Bailey dug in and continued attacking Boss even after he lost. We're not going to take this nonsense anymore and this sellout attitude. House Republicans defended Bost after Bailey backed Matt Gates in his push to strip the gavel from former Speaker Kevin McCarthy for cutting a bipartisan deal to keep the government open. Push some of these uh, failed politicians out of the way. Bost often bristled at Bailey's attacks against his conservative credentials. I am a governing conservative. While Boss defended his belief in good government. I believe that uh, the United States of America, you know, we are a Christian nation. Bailey described government as an outlet for his religious expression. The pilgrims first landed here because they were fleeing religious persecution. After his second straight loss at the ballot box, Bailey scolded other like-minded people of faith for not matching his level of fervor. Here's the deal, and here's I th where I think we're failing at. Our churches. He repeated a long-standing criticism he's leveled at the separation of church and state. Well, if the church wants to ignore and not talk about politics, then we're going to continue to see a rise in this moral behavior. Bost also professes a deeply held faith in Christianity. Look, I don't compromise my morals, but this nation is built on finding common ground. Bost described dogmatic dividing lines as a danger that can erode common ground into battleground. Well, I mean, we need to work on things, but it's still the greatest nation in the world. Before we go, let's check the record on one exchange in particular from a member of the Supreme Court who's had his own run-ins with the press. Uh, I guess uh, I'd assumed, thought, experienced uh, government press uh, people throughout the federal government who regularly call up uh, the media and and berate them. Uh, is that, I mean, is that not I, I, your I don't understanding? Want to... or you said the anger here was unusual. I, I guess I wasn't, um, so that, wasn't that, entirely clear on that from my own experience. That's fair. I guess I don't want to endorse berate, but I guess I will say I bet this is not the first time that there's been profanity or intemperate language in exchanges between White House or agency communication staff and members of the press. I can confirm this one on my own experience. Government flacks are indeed quite adept at expressing their displeasure. It often reminds me of one of my favorite journalism quotes, actually, which kind of doubles as a reminder that every act of journalism is a mini act of rebellion. News is something someone wants to suppress. Everything else 
is advertising. That does it for us this week. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be back next week with a new first-time guest interview. Until then, we're off the record.